Today the focus is, is more on ICT, the subset of technologies that we find is busy transforming the world as we know it. Um, there's probably nothing that's making a bigger impact um, on society as a whole um, than the interconnectivity of all of the things that we have. And um, here is but a small sample of all of the things that speak to the internet today. And um, this, is a, this is making a profound impact on the world all around us. And whenever we see exponential um, graphs in, in academia and in research, and especially in futures forecasting, we only know one thing. And the one thing that we absolutely know is, is there's an uncertain future that we don't yet understand. And that's the reality of exponential growth. We think in linear terms. We can plan in linear terms. Our strategy are assuming linear growth. And the moment that exponential growth happens, um, there's an uncertain future for us. But there's also the year 2017 and 2018 to survive. So what about um, our immediate future? And in futures, we talk about dots on the horizon. We're saying that, that, that there's a horizon and there are things happening. And um, I've just brought a couple of these dots for you. And these are some of the interesting dots that we see that is happening in, in, in the world of technology. And um, it is cloud computing which works well today. Um, it's the internet of things that I've alluded to very quickly. Um, it's the world of cyber that I will spend an ample amount of time on. The ability to analyze like never before. Um, so social media and all of the things that it's given the world. The cognitive abilities of our systems and what's in the mobile that we have with us and what we can do with that. Virtual reality, which imposes something new upon us. A user experience into, uh, due to technology, fun, uh, fundamentally different. Augmented reality, which puts a layer on top of what we perceive. Artificial intelligence, robotics. And um, if we don't know what to do things in IT, we just put a, a big before it. So we had data, and today we have big data. F from all of these dots on the horizon, I I've selected two. So firstly, in terms of cyber resilience, ladies and gentlemen, I've, I've just decided to bring a couple of sobering facts to you. And the sobering facts is it's more common than what you think. Probably every single person sitting in this room um, on internet um, and on email, so I hope that's probably most of you because the, in, the invite for this event was by email or internet only, um, have received these emails asking you um, to log in your account and verify the details. So if you open the 3G connectivity within this room and you're trying to connect to the internet via your mobile phone, anything is this, how often do you think is there an attempted attack on your device to see if it can get on your device? Last time I, I checked, um, about September last year, it was 27 attempts a minute. It's the responsibility of all of us and it really starts with us. So a little bit in terms of um, why is it such a big problem, the internet and the non being anonymous on the internet is no, definitely a driving factor. Wireless networks just basically removed the, the, the entrance hurdle to get into these things. The research from 2015 uh, of the negative impact of technology in the business environment in 2015 that was published last year um, was due to employees within the organization um, not following due protocol. Um, criminals follow the money and the ease of access. And as more and more value is being exchanged on the internet, as what we do on the internet becomes more important for us, and there's an ability to exchange that value and to hijack that value, of course the criminality is going to follow that as well. It's as simple as, as, as dare I say, supply and demand. Now, before you think that you, shouldn't, you will not step in the same trap that any of these people have stepped in, um, I have five questions for you. But if your answer is yes to any one of these five questions, there's a fairly high likelihood that you can be and will be hacked. The first question is, is whether your password actually contains a combination of capital letters, small letters, numericals, and special characters like dollar, sign, and pound. It should at the very least do that. Second question is if you've ever shared that with anybody. The third question is, is if you reuse or recycle passwords. The fourth question is, is if you use the same password for different sites. And then the fifth question is if your password contains any elements of your first name, your surname, your dog's name, your car, your wife, your family, the month in which you are born, um, the current year that we're in, any common information. And there's about 30, 35 common things that people use. And we find that when we analyze password, a significant amount of them have got sections of all of these things. And then there's a counter that either counts the year or count the month, or you cycle through the firstborn child and the secondborn child. If you use your children's names, obviously it's a very good practice to have a very extended family, because then there's a lot of <laughs> options that the, that the hackers need to, need to get through. 
Right, ladies and gents, this is the impact of cybercrime and um, the impact of cybercrime in the 10 biggest economies in the world. Um, you can see fairly devastating, 108 billion in the US alone. Um, but what about the good old South Africa? Certainly we're not um, in um, those situations that other finds themselves in. Uh, the biggest factor in terms of the cost of this was loss of business. And um, I'll be quite upfront with it because I think we need to be as is. We also had a bit of a challenge at the business school in terms of availability of our um, systems. And it's very clear then when you deal with the students that the students tell you, this is not what we expect. There's a reputational loss that is associated with these things that you need to manage extremely, extremely carefully. Why is FNB all across the newspapers at the moment? Not because their vault were breached, because their customers that suffered the breach feel that the institution don't care about them, don't care about their loss, and don't engage with them in terms of how they're doing that. So when these things happen, you need to take cognizance of the fact that there's a post-event process that you need to follow. Um, according to McAfee, um, the, latest, uh, the latest estimate about 2016 um, in South Africa, um, businesses lost um, close to 6 billion rand. And uh, the Ponemon Institute, the previous report that I showed to you, um, they um, estimate that globally um, in 2016, um, about 2 trillion. And um, they, pr they project that to within four years potentially reach 20 trillion US dollars. I hope you're scared. And um, if you're scared, uh, my work here is done. But it's not all doom and gloom. Um, I want to, to leave you um, with a little bit of a, a positive view on the future as well. Um, Michael Porter, um, of which you always have to quote in at least one class in every business school lecture. And in his latest article, he talks about smart connected products. And he says that this smart connected products has a new set of strategic choices for organizations. And I feel that in the organizations that I consult with, and I feel that in the organization that I'm working in. And basically what it says, it says we had the internet of things, and that now led to this internet of everything, and ultimately it leads to industry 4.0. Now I don't want to call our students things, but the reality of the students that we have that are connected today is this. We know more about a student sitting in Kukunop, engaging with us online, and a student sitting, physically sitting in front of us in the classroom. We understand how they come in, how they go out, the browser that they use, how long they engage, what they have read, how long it took them to do their quizzes. And in our world, we're starting to talk about learning analytics. And learning analytics is use these sets of information to change our engagement with our students. Now, this is a, a quote from, from, from Porter and Heppelman. It says, the changing nature of the things is ushering a new era in competition. The definition of this fourth transition, ladies and gentlemen, um, is start, the, the term was actually popularized in Germany. So uh, three and a half years ago in Germany, they started talking about industry 4.0. And um, basically the argument was that we had mechanization, then we had mass production, the Henry Ford and the like. Then we had computers and automation in the 70s and 80s and the 90s. And now the argument is that we have cyber physical systems where we are blurring the lines. And the Boston Consulting Group are talking about four, uh, three fundamental drivers. And that would um, ring very true to us because we all know about um, there's a lot of data being collected. We know that there's massive, massive sets of data collected. Everything that we do today, there's so much that we know we've given it the name Big Data. It says the analytics that we have today allow us to do certain things to this data, to see certain things, to spot trends that we haven't been able to do before. And then thirdly, the communications infrastructure, and we forget that. I forget that we wanted to use our global classroom concept five years ago. There was resistance to say, but our students don't have access to broadband internet. Today, that is just completely gone. Because according to the Boston Consulting Group, this industry is supported by a couple of things. There's autonomous robots, there's simulations where we see what something will, what will happen, and we're seeing a lot of that entering into our own worlds as well. Horizontal and vertical integration, when I show you the video of Tesla, we'll chat about that. The industrial internet of things, that everything that is connected is speaking. And as we move through our life, we find that the industrial internet of things says most of the things that we're touching are starting to have embedded um, either artificial intelligence within themselves or they are connected so that we can jointly manage them. Cybersecurity, I've mentioned now. The cloud is old. Additive manufacturing, we actually talked about last year. Augmented reality. Augmented reality is the simple fact of layering something on top of something else. I'm in Cape Town. 
I'm mostly hungry, I'm looking for a steakhouse, and if they have a lovely pinotage, I'll be very happy. I lift up my phone and I say steakhouse. And as I turn around, I still see Cape Town, but layered on top of Cape Town is the restaurants, the menus, the prices, the ratings, and yes, do they have Dimmersfontein Pinotage. And that is the reality that I want to be overlaid on the world that I'm dealing with. And these are the principles. Um, they then talk about all of these principles. On top is, is a Tesla factory. And um, at the bottom is a robot manufacturing a house. Now, um, this device lays down bricks, and it's showing you there that on top of the brick, um, it actually has a specific glue that's manufactured for those bricks that interlock a little bit like Lego. And um, that robot is, is able to build a typical size RDP house that we have here um, in uh, roughly 14, 15 minutes. Up to roof level, you need to put in the trusses, and uh, you need to put on the roof. Um, if you look at Tesla's factory on top, it started the video clip off with a roll of aluminum. It probably came from Alusaf here in South Africa. And um, if you go to the motor manufacturing in South Africa, there's the Toyota stamping division where they make panels. And then, there's the, and, and, then, and then there's the paint shop. That roll of aluminum starts on one place in that factory. They roll it, they stamp it, and you will see now all of a sudden it starts entering the production line. And as it enters the production line, um, at the other end of the production line, you see a fully assembled vehicles moving from the production line. These guys have autonomous robots, and what you will see is not a continuous production line that you find in most automotive factories today. You will see that there's an element of autonomy, and all of these robots then carry a particular vehicle, and they can move slower and faster, and there's certain flexibility that you find within these systems as well. But that is the future, and that's where we are heading. And elements of this are starting to slowly creep into our work environments. But let me then try to make it very personal for you. Um, if you can't relate to building houses and um, building Teslas in a factory. MacBooks, we all used them and they were very useful. And if you didn't have a MacBook 30 years ago, you couldn't discover the world around you. It was the appropriate technology for the time. Then we got online directions. And it was lovely because now we know we could drive from here to here. And then when you need to travel here this morning, we had a third evolution. And the third evolution is, is what is the traffic route in a part of the city that I don't know at all? And now we ask the same device, but that same device is now crowdsourcing from every single person that's driving that route to be able to tell you with a very high degree of accuracy where you will find certain traffic and all of these things. And that is not the fourth revolution, that is the third revolution. That's what is common for us today. We open our mobile phones and we do that. What we're saying in terms of Industry 4.0 is this, this is a service, this is something that we consume. What we actually want to do is just to get here. <laughs> That's all I want. <laughs> it's all I, I just want to be here. I, I, the, the fact that I need to look on a map, the fact that I need to Google and all of these things, my desire would be to step out of my home and say, please take me to. And that please take me to should take me to that. Currently, we are stuck with very old technology. We have a key. We open something, we start it, we must make sure there's petrol and oil in there, and uh, then we have to navigate, and then it will eventually take us there with a huge amount of input from our side. And what we want is just to get there. Or maybe my thinking of getting there um, is too narrow-minded. Maybe the autonomous future is different. So what? If you're not working at Tesla, you don't build houses, and you won't be able to sell, afford a self-driving car. Um, I wanted to talk, tell you about a place of doom and gloom and the importance that as managers we know um, that we're in an environment which we are, is continuously threatened. We need to be cyber resilient. And I want to say to you that irrespective of the industry that you find yourself within, um, there's a very, very interesting future in front of us where technology will be embedded in everything that we're doing. But um, I'm urging you that when you deal with cyber resilience, um, there are three fundamental steps. The first step is preventing it. And preventing it is what your IT guys are doing. There's also detecting when something is going wrong. But where organizations drop the ball at the management level is the response. You need to invest money to t pick it up very, very quickly so that if something happens, you don't wait for your clients to tell you. You know before the clients know. But then the most important is this, and this has got precious little to do with technology. At the management level, you need to define the set of actions that you do once this has occurred. And in terms of Industry 4.0, I think it's rather important to understand the drivers. According to MIT Sloan, 
the most important technology of 2017 is the human voice. Because they say 2017 is the year in which the human voice, we will ask our phone, we will ask our car, we will ask our fridge, we will move into a future where the easiest way for us to interact with our environment is asking. And they say that that is the single most important technology for 2017. Thank you very much. Thank you.